Welcome everyone to the grand round on the 7th of February. So there are two halves to these presentations. Uh, first of all, um, the endocrine team, including Kate and myself, we're talking about the steroids that we use, really, really tiny doses. And then that will be followed by the absolutely vast doses that our men's team use um, at uh, one o'clock. So we'll kick off with this case presentation. Um, Kate is going to start and um, if you would like to I'll advance the slides, Kate, if you want to. Uh, Great, thanks. So I'm one of the endocrine registrars and research fellows, and we're going to present a case looking at steroids uh, in non-COVID times. Um, so this is quite an old case. Um, for, he, was, he was 33 at the time, a bus driver. He was referred to the endocrine clinic in 2001 with a new um, clinical presentation of acromegaly. On initial examination, he showed typical acromegaly, he also looked quite cushioned. In his past medical history, he had a background of quite severe pemphigus, which he was under the dermatologist. Um, and he'd been on long-term prednisolone since the late 1990s. Um, and his dose varied between about 10 to 30 milligrams. Um, on weaning the prednisolone below, below 10 milligrams, he complained his skin was burning. Um, so he hadn't been successfully weaned off it. On initial investigations, he had a high growth hormone level and high IGF-1. And on imaging, he had a two by two centimeter pituitary macroadenoma. So in 2001, he underwent a transthenoidal hypervasectomy and he was effectively cured of his acromegaly with radiotherapy as well. Normally, you're, um, in terms of your axes from the pituitary gland, we assess ACTH, which uh, produces uh, um, signals to your adrenal glands to produce cortisol, your TSH for thyroxine, and LH for testosterone. So he was started on thyroxine and testosterone replacement, given he now had no adrenal, uh, no pituitary gland. He continued on his prednisolone um, due to the pemphigus and we never assessed his axis. And we'd like to say he remained completely well and lived happily ever after. However, in about 2014-2015, his, his pemphigus started to remit and he started weaning his prednisolone under the guidance of the dermatologist, but this wasn't known to us. He finally got down to about five milligrams once a day and then had a very slow wean by about one milligram a month. And he, on three milligrams on the wean, he remained very well. When he got down to about two milligrams, he felt very tired and he could just about drive buses still, but really wasn't feeling great. And on one milligram, he started profuse vomiting. Um, and after we increased it back up to three milligrams, so he really did the, the experiment that we'd never dared to do, you know, cutting the, the dose of prednisolone until you have a, a crisis. And this really sort of highlighted that prednisolone three milligrams should be a, was an optimal replacement dose for patients with hypo pituitarism. And Prof is going to go on to talk a little bit about uh, types of steroid replacement and where we've come sort of over the last few years. Yes, thank you, Kate. So, so that was uh, that was quite an instructive case. As Kate said, we'd never dare wean someone who had no cortisol until they had a crisis. So he did it for us, which is quite. A, it was a really useful, eye-opening thing that he did because this has opened a whole avenue of different things that we've tried to do. So really I want to just tell you a little bit about why this happened. And what is really quite interesting, of course, if you think about it, all of our cells have evolved, even from the single cell time to now, to whole animals. We have evolved for millions of years with um, a rotating Earth and a 24 hour circadian rhythm. So all cells and all animals have been exposed to this forever. And it's possible that having some mechanism to know where you are in the time of day gives you some advantage, okay? And really the question is, is it now important in humans to have this circadian rhythm or is it just a kind of redundant relic of our prehistoric need you know, existence? So we don't need to function optimally anymore. And so the real question then to us is, do we need to mimic this circadian rhythm in patients who have no pituitary gland or, or Addison's disease? So when you take a bunch of students and admit them to the ward for investigations and measure through a cannula their cortisol every 15 minutes, you get to this kind of pattern. So these students were um, admitted and the lights went out at 10.30 p.m. and that was meant to be nighttime and they woke up at 7.30. 
So this is the night time. And you can see that the rising cortisol starts well before they wake up at about 5 a.m. And it's quite reproducible day on day. And it peaks at about 8.30 a.m. So, so about an hour after you actually get out of bed is what we think. So really, this is the question. Does this enable prediction of metabolic requirements depending on the time of day? I mean, it's conserved still. So that would suggest it might be important. Now, when we try and give hydrocortisone to our patients, it has too short a half-life for once daily administration. And of course, endogenous hormones have got to have a short half-life so that you can turn them off. That's how systems work. So because we want to give them replacement dose, we're forced to give it two or three times daily. And the problem is that you get these little peaks that are not really physiological. And it's possible that these peaks are harmful. Okay, so this is one of the thoughts that we've been having. Giving it three times daily is harmful. So here's the patient having it at 8 a.m., noon, and 5 p.m., which is quite a common thing in the endocrine practice for many years. But what we'd like, of course, is a nice smooth curve like this. Now, the importance of these clocks uh, seems to be everywhere. So the hypothalamus, uh, pituitary, adrenal, and peripheral cells all have got clock genes that are all in sync and are kept in sync by the look of it with the glucocorticoid receptor. Okay, that seems to keep them all in sync. And they get desynchronized, for example, if you work a night. So night shifts are not good for your health, nor is travel when you travel east, west, and change your time zone when you get them desynchronized. But also acute stress seems to cause some desynchrony. And if you look at the peripheral cells, this is in the liver and other places, the cells have a receptor for glucocorticoid and those receptors are acetylated differentially at different times. So as the evening approaches, your cells become more and more sensitive to the same amount of cortisol. Okay, and so an evening dose is particularly harmful, maybe as harmful as working a night shift for us. Um, and so this is the other theory, and I've got some evidence to explain what I'm talking about. So here is what we see, um, which is three times a day hydrocortisone given to um, patients. And this black line is what we think we'd like to see, which is a smooth curve, okay? So these are the harmful peaks I'm gonna keep reminding you about, okay? As harmful as night shifts. Now, in reality, we are rubbish at replacing hydrocortisone, okay? So this is, if you measure it in all comers, we have a lot of massively over and some under replaced patients. This box here is where we want to be. So we are dreadful at getting it right, okay? This is the standard 10, five and five milligrams of hydrocortisone. Now, we used to give much more than that. And as time has gone on, it's become clearer and clearer that too much steroid is bad for you. And we're now down to 10, 5 and 5. So there's the molecule cortisol. When given by mouth, it's got too short half-life. That's a key fact. We need a longer lasting version. And one option that's now been marketed is a drug called Plenadrin. So this is slow release hydrocortisone. Okay. And basically it works like this. You take it by mouth and it's got two layers and it slowly releases. So this is the advert from the BMJ, and you can see that you swallow it and it travels through the gut and it's absorbed all the way through and it persistently secretes cortisol, which is what they say that your adrenal glands do. So that's not unreasonable. The problem is that it depends on continued gene absorption for hours. And of course, if you get norovirus or something, then of course you'll stop absorbing, which can be dangerous. The other problem is that a lot of patients get diarrhea as a side effect, which is no surprise because you've got an osmotic gradient now with your tablets. The other thing is that hydrocortisone is now quite cheap at six pounds a month. And of course, the premium for once daily administration from Shire Pharmaceuticals is 240 pounds a month for a tablet once daily. So that's a, that's a tricky problem. So of course it hasn't caught on yet in the UK, but this is the study that they're looking at. So they gave some patients uh, 30 milligrams of plenadrin once daily, there's their black curve, and they compared it with the same total dose of 30 milligrams, that is 15, 10, and five of thrice daily hydrocortisone, okay? And that's what they were comparing. Now, now notice two things. One is, apart from my bad late peak, there's also a much lower area under the curve, and therefore the total exposure of the patients every day to steroid is a lot lower, okay? Quite significantly lower. So there are two advantages to plenarin. One is you have less there altogether, and maybe we're over replacing. And the other is you don't have this late peak. So this is the first of many studies to try and demonstrate advantages. And what they did in this, this is in the Lancet, once daily modified release compared to 
is three times daily hydrocortisone, okay? And basically what they did was they took 89 hypoadrenal patients and randomized them. So they were already on thrice daily standard hydrocortisone and they gave 46 patients once daily modified release and they gave 43 patients three times daily hydrocortisone and they tracked them for 24 weeks. They also took 25 healthy volunteers and they simply, at the end of that time, they didn't do anything to them. They simply took a blood sample from them as well and compared these three groups. Okay, so group one, modified release, group two, three times daily, and group three, healthy volunteers. And their outcome was looking at change in body weight, change in blood sugar, A1C. And of course, body weight is the primary outcome. All these depend on body weight. If you lose weight, your glucose goes down, the A1C goes down, your BMI goes down, your lipids go down. So all of this is basically looking at body weight. So this is what they did. Here are the two groups. Here are the standard three times daily people. So annoyingly, they had a slightly different start weight by random chance. So the randomized group to normal hydrocortisone started at 70 kilos and they stayed the same. They didn't change their drug. In fact, they put on a little bit of weight to one kilo. But the group who switched to Plenadrin, who annoyingly started a bit higher, did lose three kilos in weight. So there's a significant difference. One drug makes you lose weight, the other makes you gain weight. And so it is possible that having either not having a late peak or less steroid helps you to lose weight. And of course, all the other things they looked at that go with weight loss were beneficial. But this is something novel. They also looked at monocytes and natural killer cells. In other words, and so the gray line here is the percentage of cells in healthy people. Okay, so all this time, these healthy people had blood tests and their monocyte count, that's one of the things they looked at. They looked at many different markers. This is just one of them was about 11%. And this, these two lines here are patients who started off on three times daily hydrocortisone and the red group carried on with that and the green group switch to once daily plenadrin. And you can see they're suggesting a tendency to improvement in the immune system. So to summarize those two things, either these two late peaks cause you to not lose weight and have a special immune system, or it's a total amount of steroid. And that's a key question as to what the important difference is between using these different doses. So we've been involved in this for quite a while. And as everyone knows, there is an increased mortality associated with adrenal insufficiency. And it's either due to too much steroid or it's an uncoupling timing problem. And everyone else agrees with us. Here it's now suddenly become common knowledge that regularly used twice or thrice the hydrocortisone that we all use is non-physiological. And these guys are suggesting it's the profile, the late peaks that are bad. And if you get rid of them, you'll improve the immune system. That's quite a great title. So here's a question, right? So we've got cortisol, which is half life of 180 minutes and therefore needs to be given three times daily. Now, aldosterone has a short half-life, but we don't use aldosterone, okay? It's got also a very short half-life. And so we think, how can we modify the molecule? So for aldosterone, what we've done is we stuck a fluorine atom in here. Now, fluorine does not exist in natural steroids. So when you put fluorine into a steroid, you give it a very, very long half-life because it, the, this bond is very difficult to break. And so we give once daily for the cortisone, which massively increases the half-life of aldosterone. And so we thought, how can we modify cortisol to make something that also had a longer half-life? And sticking a double bond here, giving you one, two dehydrohydrocortisone, gave it a longer half-life and made it more avidly bind to the same receptor. So it's a small change, but it made it possible to administer. So this is one, two dehydrohydrocortisone. You give a single dose and you get a rapid absorption and then a very gradual fall as it's broken down more slowly than normal cortisol. So it's rapidly absorbed with a perfect half-life. And it doesn't need to be absorbed in the gut for the whole day. So it's a lot safer than plenadrin. So this is my new drug. It's rapidly absorbed. It's got a long half-life, ideal for one-day administration. It's got a profile similar to this cortisol circadian rhythm. Now, hydrocortisone, I said, costs six pounds a month. Plenadrin costs 240. And this is, this is Liz's question, is how much do you think we should charge uh, as a venture capitalist to launch this new drug, 1,2-dehydrohydrocortisone? Have you got any, so what would you, what would you suggest? Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a, a, a socialist at heart. I would, I, I would put it the same as the hydrocortisone or a little bit more, but way below plenadrin. 
Yes. Okay. So let me tell you, uh, the good news for the NHS and for all of us, and bad news for my bank balance, is in fact that one tutorial is also known as prednisolone. Okay. And prednisolone, with its double bond there, makes it the perfect once daily replacement for our patients with adrenal insufficiency. So cortisol, six pounds a month. We'd be glad to see this list, two pounds 30 a month. So really, really cheap for three milligrams once daily. So as I've said, we started, we, we generated a, a uh, assay for prednisolone, which is now available to the whole country, uh, because if we're going to use as a replacement, we need to get the dose right. So this was a task that we had to set up. So we published this first in 2016, and that is that prednisolone replacement really, if you plot the profile, mimics the rhythm perfectly and better than any other steroid if you want to use it once daily. But the dose was a lot lower than uh, has been used by most doctors in the past. A lot of doctors use five milligrams once daily. So we thought we having we did a lot of work on this and this was the dose that we uh, came up with. You can now, if you want, measure prednisolone levels on SIR. You just type prednisolone, it'll come up as levels and you can choose different time points. But we don't do that, we will do that because we're trying to um, have a very standard way of doing this. And one of them is an eight hour level, but you need to know the time it took the prednisolone because it falls off quite rapidly. So here are some day curves that we've done on patients who have got no adrenals. And remarkably, this guy is running on two milligrams once daily. He is very well. He doesn't need any more. He's losing weight compared to hydrocortisone. So this is a really important advantage. So I thought, great, everyone's gonna accept this and we're, going to, we're going to have a lot of success and it's going to be very cheap and it's gonna be widely used. But how wrong I was. So this appeared out of the blue. Prednisolone is associated with a worse lipid profile than hydrocortisone in patients with adrenal insufficiency. I thought, where did that come from? And then I realized that uh, all the authors are from Shire Pharmaceuticals. And it's quite, quite a travesty of peer review, really. But essentially, they did a dreadful study. They took patients who on five of PRED and compared them with those on normal hydrocortisone. Now, what is quite interesting is everything actually was better on the PRED. The BMI was lower. The systolic blood pressure was a bit low. I mean, not significant. Right? I mean, there's no difference, really. The blood, dust blood pressure was also a bit lower on prednisolone, even though they were on five. And the HDL was the same, and the A1C was the same. So I thought, well, they give too much pred, and they still found it to be better. But no, they didn't do that. They ignored that, and they did a sub-analysis. So there's 47 patients, but they only analyzed 36 of them and just looked at the cholesterol, which was higher in that subgroup, and the LDL. So they only used the wrong number and they concluded that there's a significant increase in LDL and total cholesterol in patients taking prednisolone. So, I mean, you think that's a nothing, but the problem is the title only says that, okay? And if you look at the, um, at the uh, well, this page here, deck of interest, you'll see that all the employees work for Shire. So this is the reason it's been published, of course, prednisolone at two pounds is a direct competitor with this 240 pounds. So just beware that when you uh, see the rep for Plenadrin, the paper will say, the title of the paper will say, prednisolone is bad, but just bear in mind that the data on which it's based is completely flawed. So to counteract that, I thought I'd write a letter, I'm not write a letter, let's just do this idea, it gets very easy to do, we'll just use the right of prednisolone. So we actually had by this point, because all our patients were being discharged on prednisolone, um, because it was a lot cheaper, because uh, at, actually at the time, even hydrocortisone was quite expensive. There's another story I think about at some other time about cost. But essentially, we were doing the study properly. So this is a really key message, right? Five milligrams, one day of prednisolone is excessive for replacement. It's an immunosuppressive dose. It's fine if you want to suppress people, but you are giving them too much steroid and you are going to cause all the features of a slightly higher uh, lipids and osteoporosis and so on. So if you want to replace them and not suppress them, you've got to give less than five. Now, of course, the people on PRED were much happier because it's once daily, so it's more convenient. So what we really need is a randomized controlled trial, which is blind. So we did everything basically, and everything looks a bit better. Um, so we wrote this, okay? Rather than write a letter, just publish another paper that says is the same as hydrocortisone in replacement and uh, that got published, but we're not the only one. So here is a group in 2004 who looked at the group of patients who had congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Now they're a good group to study because they have another marker, i.e. growth. So if you get it wrong, they don't grow properly. And they were complaining that multiple daily doses of hydrocortisone does not reproduce cortisol chronobiology, which is exactly the right message 
2004, they said this, and they said they compared it with a single morning oral prednisolone. And their conclusion was a single morning prednisolone appeared to achieve better clinical and hormonal control. And this is the key, right? They found that they could cut the dose and the equivalent strengths was six to eight, so seven to one. In other words, prednisolone was seven times more potent than hydrocortisone. So we're saying the same thing, really. Three of pred is about 20 of hydrocortisone. So these textbooks that we still see are incorrect. 20 of hydrocortisone is not five of pred, it's three of pred, and the drug is seven times more potent than hydrocortisone. So uh, we should be using about three milligrams once daily. We've got levels and we think two to four is the right thing. But what we need is a blind randomized controlled trial to compare once daily prednisolone with thrice daily hydrocortisone. Um, and of course, if you want plenary involved and they'll need to support, they're not at all keen. In fact, they've gone on to publish yet another terrible paper. This time it's worse bone mineral density in adrenal failure. And again, dreadful study. They've got a bunch of patients who start off on prednisolone already with low bone density and follow them for five years, not much change. But it is lower bone density than the people on hydrocortisone because they're on too much. Conclusion, it's associated with a worse <laughs> bone mineral density. So you've got to ignore these dreadful papers. So really, we're moving forward with doing a randomized blind control trial. These are the day codes. We're trying to work out what exactly is the right dose for each patient. Um, this is our randomized control trial that's starting. Uh, we're making hydrocortisone and placebo. So they're going to have prednisolone, placebo, placebo, crossed over with three times daily hydrocortisone. And this will report in 2023, and then we'll have actual evidence for which one is better. Because we really need to know if prednisolone is safer because there is a lot of anxiety because we've used it for so many years in much higher doses so we need to have proper evidence before we tell everyone to switch over but we've done a review and when you compare dual release hydrocortisone that is plenident with um, prednisolone you find that they're exactly the same in terms of levels okay compared to circadian rhythm and much better than this terrible three times daily hydrocortisone replacement so just to summarize and answer the questions now, prednisolone two to four milligrams once daily is ideal replacement for adrenal failure. Uh, prednisolone five milligrams is too much for all our patients. If they don't need suppression, it causes weight gain, osteoporosis and adrenal suppression. Um, we're doing a study, um, especially with COVID around now, to look at long term steroid exposure and what level of um, cortisol people uh, will have post high dose steroids. So thank you all very much. And uh, I'd like to hear any questions if anyone's got them. And I must also check that on Min's online. I saw something come in the chat. I'll take a quick look at the chat. It, I mean, as someone who had a no steroid trial scuppered by the fact that everyone was in, on steroids and lupus, I, I think this is, fa I mean, I think it's fascinating. And I love to hear that five milligrams is, is too much because people leave people on five milligrams on the basis that it's a safe low dose and, and don't wean them down to lower doses. So hugely important message. But do you really have equipoise to put people in the trial? Because um, you yeah. don't have had cortisone. <laughs> well, I think the problem, the problem is, the whole country is still using 300 day hydrocortisone. This, this message that you're hearing, uh, everyone goes, really? Oh my goodness, we don't do prednisone, that terrible drug that causes osteoporosis. We don't like it, you see? And this is, this is the message that's out there. So, so we've got a number of randomized trials and we've got crossover trials and we've got um, a national thing that's going to help people try both out. Uh, whenever you switch some patients, a lot of patients say, I can't feel any difference. Um, there's some very interesting data looking at aches and pains. So, so there's a big difference, of course, between your patients, because when you cut below five, your disease might reactivate. Oh, well, yeah, I said that. Of disease. Yeah. Now, COVID is going to be an interesting one because COVID is a disease that comes and goes. And you don't, you're not left with like, you know, some autoimmune disease that might make you tired, if you understand my meaning. And so we can properly see what happens if we stop it dead or wean them rapidly or wean them slowly but this hasn't been done because all the other the rheumatoid have got some very good data but all their patients have a disease which is which is more difficult to wean than the adrenal failure the other thing is if you give it five of bread or 20 of dex for the adrenal gland it's the same it's just complete suppression so so um, you see liz has had got equipoise and and obviously i am i think i accept that i am biased and liz is biased too and i think 
that I, th I think we do have equipoise nationally because a lot of patients are still on hydrocortisone. A, a large majority of the world is eating hydrocortisone. Yeah, I've, also, yeah. I've also got some contacts around the world. So there are other countries um, where you can't get hydrocortisone um, or it's difficult to get hold of. And prednisone is always really, really, really cheap. So it is the same thing, but everyone's on five. And that Hi, Prof. Um, I just want to ask about chronic respiratory patients. So a lot of them wean by one milligram alternate months over several months. And then usually after a few weeks of weaning to nothing, for instance, they then develop tiredness and aches and pains. Is there, is there a way of just diagnosing it? adrenal suppression just is it the standard way or if they still on like one milligram is it relevant in those patients so i uh, so it's really interesting you see all of the different groups respiratory they've all got different protocols that i've looked at there's and they all work because they're all slower than what we need okay so your protocol will work very well and the only problem is if they have an undiagnosed incidental other cause of adrenal suppression like our patient who had a history out okay that was another cause but the dermatologist method of doing it is excellent. One milligram per month is sufficient to let the adrenal wake up if you have a pituitary. So unless there's some other cause of it, your protocol is absolutely perfect. Okay, the adrenal will recover. A synaptic test, and that's, this is email I just down here, where the genes for COVID, because there's going to be a lot of adrenal suppression with post long-term high dose death that we hear about shortly. Um, so if you want to do a synaptic test, we can do that for you. And in almost all cases, it proves that they are normal. And of course, you know, any, any of the illnesses that you see can cause people to have tiredness. So we're very happy to do, in fact, if you just do an early morning cortisol and it's not, it's more than 200, it's not caused by adrenal failure. 